My name's Charlie. I'm product manager for the robots and for Additive. There actually is some overlap there somewhere, but uh, even though it might not be immediately apparent. I'll be presenting today with Gordon. So Gordon's our applications manager, a crack team of engineers based in Windsor. And uh, Gordon tries to keep them out of as much trouble as they put him into, I think. So um, we'll be presenting today. I'll be doing the bit that you all just wish I'd shut up and get on with it and let Gordon get on with some of the cool technical stuff. So, um, but no, hopefully, we received criticism some of the Dogecoin presentations last year for being too marketing focused and sales focused. So hopefully we've got a balance here of just talking a little bit about the wider market, but also the technical content in my bit. And then Gordon goes very technical where you'll see the software in operation and see how to actually program the robots. So the, the class summary, um, just talking about robots in general. Uh, robots provide a unique platform for machining large volumes. Uh, so this is the, the idea that you know, to, to achieve what you can achieve with a robot when it comes to machining and other applications, the traditional machine tools you would need to buy would be considerably more expensive. And on top of this, you can increase your envelope. So if you have a robot one day, you might stick a rotary table on there, which improves your machining or uh, manufacturing capabilities. It might be that you want to increase scope, so you stick it on a rail, and then the rail is as long as you want to make the rail. So machining envelope is a concept that begins to become irrelevant once you start moving into the world of robots. At the end of the class, uh, you will know how to offline program a robot for complex processes. So we're not just about machining at Delcam. We are about path planning for robots. Now, what that robot's actually doing is sort of irrelevant, whether it's laying down tape or laying down glue or spray painting or machining or trimming. It really doesn't matter to us. Um, it's about planning a complex path for the robot to follow. How to simulate the results and optimize the movements of the robot. So this is a big thing about, uh, about robots, and we'll talk about some of the challenges of programming robots and why it's not just as simple as programming a machine tool. And then, uh, as I say, the, the unique challenges. So what is it specifically that's difficult, uh, or, or what are the challenges that you face when it comes to programming robots? You know, why isn't everybody doing this? So first of all, let's clarify what we're talking about when we talk about robots. So uh, there are two broad categories. There are service robots and there are industrial robots. So service robots could be anything from this kind of monstrous contraption used in uh, the medical industry. Right the way down to some of you may have this one of these at home, robotic vacuum cleaner that wanders around the house, uh, hoovering up after you. Now the interesting thing is, I mean, I was listening to a news article the other day, and there was a university professor from England insisting we'd all have service robots in the house within five years. And looking at this next clip, I think that might be a little bit optimistic. So, <laughs> Looks like you on a Saturday night. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that is, despite being British, that is like me playing football. I, I don't play football. I'm absolutely terrible at it. So, um, but no, we are interested in industrial robotics. We we don't. The class today and our offering is not about programming or, or working with service robotics. It is about industrial robotics. Now, we further see a subdivision into three broad categories in the world of industrial robotics. So first off, you've got your level one. So level one is your pick and place, your most simplistic of operations. It's holding something, moving something, whatever. Same repetitive process. In terms of software for programming these, quite often, it'll be teach and learn. So move the robot to a position in the teach pendant, record that position, move it to another position, teach pendant, record the position go through the process and build up a set of moves for the robot to follow. So quite simplistic, not a massive requirement for offline programming. Most of it is inbuilt into the controls. Level two, we start to see a bit of a hybrid. So these could still be quite simplistic operations. So things like welding. Now, welding can be fantastically complex, but it might be that I just want to put an inch, two inch bead of weld between two surfaces. In that case, it could be that you just use Teach and Learn again. You use the inbuilt software within the robot control, or it might be that you do want to use offline programming if it becomes more complicated. Nice example here is 
a grinding or polishing operation. If it's a simple, flat, smooth surface, it's very easy to program the robot to run a grinder or polisher across that. As soon as it becomes round, that becomes a very lengthy process to teach and learn through every single point in a rotation. So here's the kind of halfway house. Some people want offline, some people don't want offline. The robot manufacturers do provide some software capable of programming for these environments. So it, it's a, there's an overlap here. It's not definitive one way or the other. And then at the very far end of the scale, you've got complex path planning operations. So this is a machining operation, for example, but it could be just as easily a complex grinding, polishing operation, complex five-axis trimming operations, laying down of materials that could be glue, resins, uh, carbon fiber, whatever. These are the complex operations that really there is no other way of doing them other than offline programming. Just a very brief touch on the size of the market, just to give you an indication of the sort of relevance of all this. It's sold, uh, it's a, the source is the International Federation of Robotics Statistical Department. They reckon the market's worth about 32 billion a year. Um, I think that seems a little bit high, personally, but that's what they claim. There's uh, 230,000 robots sold globally last year. It's an increasing market, by all accounts, and interestingly, Offline programming is an incre increasing market. People are using these robots to do what the manufacturers never expected they would be used for, and all the manufacturers are openly admitting that. Five years ago, talking to OEMs, they weren't really that interested in offline programming because that's, what, what, that's not what their robots were designed for. Now they realize that more and more people are actually taking these robots and doing very, very interesting and weird applications with them, and it's surprising them, and they're starting to pay attention about how they can help uh, people to do this. So one of the limitations, for example, is the controls on robots compared to machine tools are really dumb in comparison. They still have the problem that they can't take more than 3,000 lines. So you start having to drip feed code into the robots, a problem that CNC machine tools overcame 15, 20 years ago. So you're still going back to some of these very old fashioned problems that we used to have with machine tools, we still have with robots. But because of this changing demand in the markets, the manufacturers are paying attention, so they're putting more complex, more CNC-like controls into their robots, so you're getting rid of these problems. So applications, by, an, by a million miles, the largest application for industrial robots is pick and place. So it's worth us just getting that out of the way that, that the vast majority of robots out there don't require offline programming. They work in a production environment, they do the same task, a million times before they're taken out of service and scrapped or moved elsewhere or sold. Moving into the stuff that does require the offline programming, we've already touched on it a little bit, but everything from grinding, polishing, trimming, welding, machining, material laydown, etc. And these are all the areas that Delcam is currently working in, currently has customers in those areas. So what are the challenges that you face? Okay, well, let's Forget all about robots for a moment and just talk about CNC machine tools. So does everybody, does everybody have some level of familiarity with CNC machine tools? Okay, so you're all aware that when, we, when we're using a CAM program to program a machine tool, we generate a toolpath, which often looks like a series of green lines. And all those green lines, or any single point on that toolpath, is effectively described as an XYZ coordinate in space. So you prefer Z, don't you? XYZ coordinate in space. So if that's three axis, we just need to specify the x, y, z coordinate. As soon as you start moving into five axis, so here's my tool, we need to specify an x, y, z and an a, b, c rotation or an i, j, k vector. But that's all you need to do. Machine tool, and this is one of the things when you really think about it with CAM systems, they don't tell the machine tool what configuration to be in. They tell the machine tool the end point of the tool and an orientation. So, that becomes apparent when you look at an asymmetric head. You could output the code to the machine tool, and the machine solver will decide whether to go with one solution or another. Traditionally, CAM systems don't tell the machine tool which orientation to be in. Now, we can in PowerMill. We, we have the ability with orientation vectors. We can, because this is obviously a problem. You could introduce collisions here that you weren't expecting. Whether the machine head is the first orientation or the second orientation, maybe the difference between colliding with the model and not colliding with the model. So it's a problem we 
overcame. In PowerMill, you can output which one of the configurations, but by standard, by default, we don't care. We let the machine decide. But then, that's quite simple. There's only two possible solutions. So the solution with machine tools was just to give it the two possible solutions, and then you choose the one that you want. With a robot, it gets a lot more difficult than that. So for any one position in space and any one orientation, so any one position and vector of a tooltip, you could have four various configurations of the robot. So each of those is the same tooltip position in those four configurations. If you take the wrist of the robot and rotate it by 180 degrees and 90 degrees, you then have another four configurations all with the exact same tooltip point and vector. So all of those eight configurations of the robot leave the tooltip and the vector position in exactly the same orientation. Now, if I just output to my robot XYZ ABC, the robot's got to decide which one of those orientations to be in, which leaves you wide open for collisions, axis limits, singularities, which we'll come on to in a moment. We just don't know what's going to happen with the robot. So people, it was interesting, um, it's a little bit sad that we, we haven't seen more of the people that were in the Dynamo Robots class um, that was on yesterday, because lots of them were asking kind of, how do you do this, and how, what about that problem and that problem? And that's the great thing about this. We solve all of these problems, and all of these are considered within the solution. So people talk about a safety-rated simulation. What you see in PowerMill Robot is what you get on the robot. So we don't do the traditional post-processing that you would for a machine tool. We record a full simulation. So every joint angle, every position, every orientation of the robot is all put into the code that goes to the robot. So what you've witnessed happened on the screen is exactly what you will get on the robot. The robot doesn't make any of these decisions. We control everything. Singularities. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with singularities. So singularities, you can have an elbow singularity, an alignment singularity, or a wrist singularity. And this is coming back a little bit again to robots not being or not having highly intelligent control systems. And a singularity, for anybody that doesn't know, I apologize if I'm teaching you something you all know, if we imagine my arm as a robot arm, and I've got a six axis, my wrist joint, we have a, a line, imagine an imaginary line running up my arm, and I've got the wrist kicked over like this. As my wrist moves into an alignment, once that becomes perfectly in line, the next move to continue going that direction can be two possible scenarios. It can be that the wrist just carries on going like that, or it can be that this rotates and the wrist goes that way. The robot can't make that decision. So if you hit a singularity, the robot simply stops. It can't continue past that point. So any programming software with robots has to take into account what to do in singularities. It has to analyze, look for singularities, and stop them from occurring. Just some robot terminology that you'll all uh, may or may not be familiar with. Robots, a typical robot arm has six rotary axes. These can either be referred to as axes or joints. So you get axis one, joint one, axis two, joint two, etc. Or just J or A. So A1, J1, etc. Joint angles define the overall robot position. And a home position, every robot will have a home position, and these are unique to manufacturers. And that will just be a predetermined set of joint angles. So I heard somebody say yesterday that it's when all joint angles are zero, and that's not completely correct. It's just a predetermined set of joint angles that puts the robot back to its home. Some homes are straight up in the air, others are the robot sort of perched over itself in a sort of strong position. So they differ depending on the manufacturer. This was another question that came up, which, um, interestingly, it would have been great to have a few of the guys come in here and, and see it explained in this sort of pictorial form. So robots is all about work planes or work frames, as they're often referred to. So you have two work planes, one down here, the green one, one down here, the red one. They are specific to the robot. So whether you acknowledge them or not, the robot knows about these two work planes. And that will be the base frame, um, or also the robot world work plane. Sorry, not the base work plane. The robot world work plane, 
which can be referred to as a base. So KUKUF referred to them as bases as opposed to, to work planes. So you've got robot work plane and the six axis work plane. So that will be on the flange face of the sixth axis. And again, depending on the robot manufacturer, each robot manufacturer has that in a different orientation. Sometimes Z comes up and X comes out the face of the robot. Other times Z comes out the face of the robot. So each robot manufacturer has their own one of these. Sometimes that will be up on that mating flange instead, depending on the manufacturer, but they will exist in one form or another. The other two relevant for our applications are set up by our user. So you have the tool work plane. So this is tool tip position. And again, you configure the orientation and what's going on here. And you'll see how this work plane when running around a toolpath impacts on the orientation of the robot arm and head of the robot. You've also got the part origin work plane. And again, Gordon, do you play the video in your presentation about just setting the, the part origin work plane? I don't, so, no. Okay, so um, do, do you mention it at all? Um, I can describe it a bit. Okay, yeah, if, if you could just describe it when you, yeah. when you go in there. But effectively, you are giving... Um, not dissimilar to a CNC machine tool, a G54. You're specifying the origin of those toolpaths of that part. So just a few other tools within the software that assist us with actually programming these robots and look at some of the challenges that you have with programming robots. The first big one is collision checking. So ignoring robots for a second, one of the staples and necessary requirements of any CAM system is to check that your tool and your holder is not colliding with the model in any way. So you don't want gouges, you don't want collisions. But then you need to go beyond that with robots. So you need to check that every single element of the robot is not colliding with the part, with the model, with itself, or with anything within the surrounding cell. So we can check the part against various parts of the work holding. We can check parts of the robot against external axes, bits of the robot against itself, bits of the robot against the model. So we're looking for all of these collisions, and we have various ways of presenting them to the user. One way is just highlighting them red. It's not a red robot there. It's turned red because it's found a collision. You can have a big pop-up on the screen. You can print out a list of collisions, etc. So there's lots of ways of controlling and displaying collisions to the user. Next, you need to think about kinematics of the robot. So traditionally, we have a robotic arm. In its most simple form, you've got a robot arm with an end effector. That end effector could be a glue gun, a welding torch, a spindle for milling, whatever you like. You've got your robot with the end effector stuck on the end. Then going into slightly more complex configurations, you've got the robot arm with a rotary table. And that can be a simple rotary table, or it could be a multi-position, two-axis rotary table, like we have here. You could put the robot on a linear track. You could put the robot on a linear track and have a rotary uh, part location. Or alternatively, you can flip things around. So it might be that instead of the robot holding the spindle and machining, you mount the spindle externally, and the robot picks up the part and machines the part with the fixed external spindle. So all of these various configurations need to be programmable within the software. So we can support up to 18 axes, which is one robot and 12 external axes, which then also means that you can support multiple robots because you run your multiple additional robots as being a series of external axes. If you think about it, the robot's made up of six axes, so it just makes it six external axes to the main robot. All of these brands are supported. Um, so all of the traditional big boys that you hear about on a regular basis, KUKA, ABB, uh, Fanuc, Staubly, et cetera, some of the smaller ones that perhaps you, haven't, you don't hear so much of, this list is actually missing one. We've just added a Taiwanese robot brand called Hiwin into the software as well. So just a brief overview of the workflow process. So we calculate our toolpath. And this is exactly the same for whether it's a CNC machine tool or a robot. Calculate a toolpath. We then bring the robot in, specify the setup, and go through a simulation of the robot. So this is where we do all our, all our analysis. Are there any axis limits? Are there any singularities? Uh, do, do we like the orientation, the position of the robot? The robot could be kind of machining itself down here, or we could just 
pick that elbow up and put it into a new orientation. So we simulated. Do we like the results? We've got full control over them, so we can modify everything we want. Run it back through the simulation again. When you're completely happy with everything, you can effectively then post-process and output this into a language that the robot understands. So this is what the interface looks like for anybody that, has anybody not seen Powermill Robot? OK, great. So this bit over here is Powermill Robot and the bit down the bottom. The rest of what you're looking at is Powermill, our standard CAM system. So in Powermill, this is where you do all your toolpath creation, boundary editing, pattern creation. These are where all the entities of Powermill live, your tool generation, toolpaths, etc. So they all live here. Then you've got your graphical area, where you simply display your models, your machine tools, whatever it is that you're looking at. And then Powermill Robot actually lives as what we call a plugin, so it lives within the Powermill environment. And then down here, a range of tools for your simulation analysis. So here, for example, and you'll see this with Gordon's demonstration, you can control all of the axes, so you can move the axes around, optimize the simulation. And here, the bottom, is a bit of a sanity check. So any kind of singularities, axis limits, etc., collisions, will be showing up along this, the bottom of this line. So this is effectively a timeline through the simulation. And any faults or problems that it finds, you'll see a red dot highlighted along that bar. A few other just recent um, updates into the software, which are particularly relevant to programming robots and overcome some challenges. Single point parameters. So any toolpath is made up of a series of toolpath points. What we can do here is add toolpath parameters or parameters or variables to those points which then go out to the robot program. So what, why do you want this? OK, great example. Let's say this is a welding torch, and you only want to weld, let's say, half of that circle. You can have a toolpath parameter that outputs a command within the code to say, turn on the welding torch. Then over here, you could set a toolpath point parameter to say, turn off the welding torch. And that could be the same for spindles, coolant, glue guns, whatever. It enables you to output a parameter that the robot can make use of. Next, just using, we're trying to make the online environment as close to using a robot in real life as possible. So we have a virtual teach pendant. So nearly all robots will have a, a teach pendant associated with them. So that's a KUKA teach pendant. Uh, that's an ABB teach pendant. And this is used by the user to move the robot around, control the various axes, and so on. So we've got the same display and virtual teach pendant that lives inside the software. And you can now also plug a space mouse in to your PC and control the robot with the same space mouse that you would find on the teach pendants. So that user feel and interaction is the same whether it's in the software or whether it's standing next to the robot in real life. If, for whatever reason, you decided that you didn't want to use PowerMill to generate your toolpaths, heaven forbid, we think you should, it's great software, but if you wanted to use another CAM system that you were more familiar with, you can still use Powermill Robot for all of the generation and the robot-related bits of the manufacturing process. So we can take somebody else's NC code from another CAM system, import it into Powermill Robot, and it will generate a toolpath based on their NC code, and then we can do all of the robot simulation and control as we move it around. Orientation vectors, these are a lot easier to demonstrate than they are to explain. It's really quite simple. I'll, I'll probably make it sound awfully complex as I'm trying to explain it to you. But it's really quite simple. Every single toolpath point has a vector or a tail kicking off it that has a direction. Think back to that tool, power, that tool work plane that sits at the end of the tool. You can use the vector or tail of that toolpath to control this axis which subsequently controls the orientation of the robot. And you can do this. One of the great strengths, I don't know if people know about PowerMill, is just the level of control that you have. It blows traditional CAM users away when they see that you can go into a toolpath, select an area, delete that area, select another area, update the tool axis, select a single lead in from the entire toolpath segment, change how it leads in in that area. And there's no recalculation. That all just happens. 
So the level of control is phenomenal, and the same is with orientation vector. So I could select a single area of the toolpath and kick the orientation vector around in that particular area. So the robot, as it comes around, it reaches the area that I've controlled, the orientation changes until it moves past that point, and then it goes back to its default standard orientation. So you've got full control over the robot at every point within the toolpath. Tracing tooltip moves. So let's say you've got a toolpath over here and a toolpath over here. We want to know how the robot's going to move between those two points. So again, we can visualize this, display this, and we can also control this within PowerMill. Uh, segment type detection. Again, not dissimilar to the point parameters we spoke about. If you can imagine everything in PowerMill, you can see it quite well there. So the, the green bits are toolpaths. Then you get an orange bit, which would be a lead-in or a link. Then you get the blue or the cyan-colored bits. They're a plunge move. And you get the, the red dotted bits. They're rapid moves. So in PowerMill, you can control, for CNC machine tools, you can control the feed rate for every move type. But in PowerMill Robot now, you can detect the segment type. And this, again, is useful for parameters like welding, for example. So every cutting move, make sure that we've got the welding torch on. But make sure it's off for all the rest of it. Otherwise, you're going to be firing the welding torch as it moves around the part. So we're also supporting arcs. Now, going back to conversations about robot controls. So this becomes quite, uh, quite important for controlling robots when they don't have very sophisticated controls. So you can de describe an arc in two ways. You can describe it as a series of polygonized points, or you can describe it as an end point, a start point, and a midpoint, and an arc between the two. And seeing different machine controls like different inputs to make the machine behave in the smoothest possible manner. Robots are not, robots are exactly the same. They, they, different robots, different controls want different inputs. And again, you've got full control over that in PowerMill, what that output actually looks like. So we just quickly go through a few examples of people using this stuff, just to give you an idea of the, the types of markets that we're seeing people use it. It's very difficult to cover all of our customer bases in this. So I think there's probably four examples here. <coughs> so this is a company in Australia. They're doing uh, composite reinforced concrete. So they've got their huge robot making these weird and wonderful um, architectural type prop type display type objects. So here there are some of them in a, a local park, local ex exhibitions, and so on. So the next one we're going to have a look at is a stone machining example. So people using it for milling stone sculptures. Now, this is a company in France, Lithius. You can imagine if you take a, a solid block of stone, getting that down to a near net shape, a near finished shape, is quite an arduous, horrible process. So if you can, another great application for them are sets, props, uh, displays, movies, things like that. So Artem, um, you can see here they're milling sort of display type pieces. Um, a lot of their work is sort of soft materials, polystyrenes, woods, resins, etc. And I think you know, one of the, the great pieces is here. So we've got a triathlon event. They've machined this gigantic swimmer uh, as a huge sort of display piece. I mean, can you imagine the size of the machine tool you would need to actually machine that on a, mach on a normal CNC milling machine? It, it, the cost of that would be astronomical. And you can do that with a, a, with a robot without too much of a problem. So these guys are dead interesting. This is a company over in Norway. They are machining ice, so ice sculptures with robots. So the engineer that went over to install this was from the UK, and he said that room was the coldest place he'd ever been in, just because everything was at constantly low temperature. I mean, even the robot is having to wear a jacket to stop the oil freezing in the joints. But he said, interestingly, so you imagine we're standing looking, the camera's facing this direction. He said, if you turned around and looked, as far as you could see was just rows of shelves of blocks of ice. And they would walk along, and it said it was like a, a fine wine distillery, where they go, oh, this one was from 98. This was a good year. And depending on how cold it had been that year, the clarity of the ice would be different. So when somebody went to buy a sculpture, they could walk along this and pick out the block of ice they wanted the sculpture from. 
The other thing is if you see how they harvest that ice, it is insane. They've got a boat or two boats with planks between them and two sort of chainsaws on the boat and they go out onto the ice and this horrible looking contraption cut the ice out of a frozen lake, basically. Norway. So, but we're not just about playing. We have some real serious high-end engineering processes with robots. So this is adaptive machining. Now this is a, a process for aerospace blades when every single one is a little bit different to the last. So the robot takes the aerospace blade, it brings it over here to the probe and measures it. It then compares the measured results against nominal CAD data and updates the toolpaths. This is all automatic, updates the toolpaths specifically to the part that it's got not the part that's in the CAD. It can then go away, automatically generate a toolpath for that. So here's the toolpath being generated. And it's then going to go and polish that blade within the cell. Once it's done a polishing operation, it can check that part again, compare it to CAD data. Has it taken off enough material? If not, it can repeat the cycle. And the same is used for machining the parts to length. So it measures the length of the part, compares it to the nominal CAD, and then adapts the toolpath and goes off and machines that blade to length. So whilst there are a massive array of simplistic lightweight applications with soft materials, there's also very involved, very precise engineering processes that are just as relevant. And it's worth pointing out there that these, these operations are generally um, a collection of Delcam software. So there we saw PowerMill, PowerMill Robot, and Power Inspect combined. And they'll, the combination or the service will be put together by Delcam Professional Services, which is a team of consultancy engineers from Delcam that can solve particularly difficult manufacturing problems for people. So just to reiterate, we see the programming of robots as three steps, three very simplistic steps. You generate the path that you want the robot to follow. It doesn't have to be a tool path. It doesn't have to be a welding path. We don't really care. It's a path that you want the end effector to follow. You then bring the robot in and control how it's going to follow that path. What's the orientation? Is the wrist going to be up? Is the wrist going to be down? Is it safe, etc.? So you've got your toolpath, how the robot's going to move around that toolpath, and then post-processing into a language the robot understands. What you see is what you get. We spoke about this at the very beginning. The robot the real robot in the real world will never do anything that it hasn't done on that screen unless you as a user have made a mistake in the setup. How this works and the way that it records the movements and outputs the movements, there is no ambiguity, there is no room for the robot to solve anything that is given to it because all of the solving is being done within the software. So there's never any ambiguity about what's going to happen when you take that to the machine and run it. If you have set up the appropriate work planes and configured the robot correctly. So, I think I've got two slides. I don't, I, this is the first time I've presented at AU, and by reading the slide pack, I think I have to show you both of these slides. I don't know what, uh, <laughs> apparently you can tweet, you can find out about it, you can catch up on class presentations. We're being recorded right now, so if you want to go online and pass it along or catch up on anything or repeat anything that I've said, then uh, you can find it all on the AU website. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Gordon, and you can get onto the bits that I'm sure you all really want to see, which is the software in action. Thank you, Charlie. Is that mine or yours? That's yours there. So do we... This class runs until top of the hour, is that correct? It's one hour long, if I'm not mistaken? I should know that, I know. What, uh, what number is that? Six. Six. Okay, so I think I've got uh, a little less time than I thought, so <clears throat> I'll try not to, to waffle on too long and kind of stick, stick to the software um, talking for itself. So what, the window you see right now is PowerMill. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the tool paths, the robot paths uh, for grinding, for cutting, trimming, milling, is all going to be generated through all the powerful tools um, inherent to the PowerMill package. OK, 
Okay, so for those, I know, I know a couple of us here do have power mill experience. So uh, in the left-hand side, we have the all-important power mill explorer. By double-clicking some of these, uh, these tool paths, you can see the actual tool and the green uh, paths that they um, that define them. Okay? So the robot add-on is a plugin. So once we've created the tool path, it's what we want. It uses the correct tool. It's going to remove the correct amount of material. We then switch over to Palmol Robot itself. So if we break it down quickly, <clears throat> it consists of four tabs. So I'm briefly going to take you through the workflow, and then we'll go back and, get, and explain it in a little bit more depth. Step number one is tab number one. Robot library, select the robot. As you can see, we support all the mainstream robots. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be a little bit unbiased here, and I'm going to say I want a six-axis robot with a rotary table. Okay? So by double-clicking on it, the robot's activated. I can see the cell. In this case, we have the rotary table. This can be built up with, you know, uh, with curtains, with gates, tool changes, any kind of auxiliary components that your robot cell contains. All important to the, to the collision checking, of course. Step number two is the alignment of the part to the robot. Now, as Charlie mentioned a little bit earlier, there's, from a user perspective, there's really two things that can go wrong with these robots. Okay? Inc incorrectly defined tool work plane, which is this blue entity you see here. So this must be accurately defined in relation to the robot six-axis work plane. That's known. The user work plane is unknown. All of this okay? is documented So Powell Robot, because it knows the length of the tool, it knows the design file of the spindle, it's very easy for us to then backplot the, the tool work plane or the tool frame. Very similar for the base frame as well. In this instance, the base frame is probably not going to change too much because it's generally going to be in the center of this rotary table. Um, but when we teach a base frame, we really are just teaching a, an origin, a, 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 a place in space. And usually that's done by uh, the origin, the zero position, the XY plane, and the X direction. We, we call this teaching a frame. Okay, so for example, in this instance, if, if I did perhaps want to move it, just a very simple example, let's say I wanted to move the part upwards by 250 millimeters and perhaps rotate at 90 degrees. Okay? It's as simple as positioning those values or reading it off of the robot after you've taught the robot. Okay? So there's this new position. Alternatively, I'll switch it back to the default position. Okay, so tab number two, aligning the workpiece to the robot. Tab number three is really where all the action happens. This is where we simulate. Also record and run a diagnostics. Okay, so let's send the robot home. I'm just going to slow this first simulation down somewhat. We attach the robot to start, which more or less says, okay, I'm ready, begin the recording, play. So in the background, what Powell Robot's doing is it's recording the position of that all-important tool frame. Okay? And what it's also doing is it's recording the posture. You'll remember Charlie talks about those, those eight possible configurations. It knows what configuration the robot's in, so there's no ambiguity when it gets to the robot. It's not going to choose the other seven. It knows that's exactly how the robot is. Okay? Record. Give it a name. And once we've given it a name, we go down to the bottom simulator, and down here, if I just expand this, this is the analysis and the playback. So you'll notice in real time, I can just simply, perhaps not real time, but I can drag the simulator, and you can see what happens at every stage of this toolpath. We also get all the check marks, which tells me this will run successfully on the robot. Okay? The last and final operation, tab number four, is the post-processing. Okay? And this stage is actually quite simple. We give it a name. We choose the base frame, if it wasn't the center of the rotary table. We add a simulation. And then, based on the, the robot we've selected, we post the actual code. So this is where things change. In the CNC world, G-code is, is generally G-code. Of course, we get Heidenheim controllers and Siemens controllers. But on robots, 
they're all very different. The, the Kuka language is very different from the Fanuk language, ABB language, etc. Okay? But essentially, we're defining uh, positions in space. Translation, rotation, matrix. Okay? It's not really important that you know what these numbers mean. It's important to know that, as Charlie mentioned, the simulation is what actually is going to happen on the robot. Okay, so that's, that's the process, the workflow from, from you know, step A through B, C, and D. Let's talk about advanced controls then. So this was a three-axis toolpath we initially looked at. And when I say three-axis on a robot, obviously it's, it's a little ambiguous because a robot's got, got six axes already. This next toolpath we're going to look at is what we, what we would call in the, in the CNC world a three-plus-two toolpath. So if I activate this toolpath, go into my robot, robot control tab, send the robot home, position it, you'll notice it takes a default posture. This is important. So this default posture, it may be the one I want, or perhaps not. Okay? Um, what's important about these robots is sometimes the, the, the simplest path for it to take is not the most optimal. So when we're, when we're outputting robot paths, we want explicit control and we want predictability. Okay, just simply letting the robot solve the quickest um, path from A to B is not always optimal. Think about this end effector. It's a spindle. Spindles need coolant. Spindle needs electrics. So chances are you've got cables running all over this particular robot here. Okay? And an operation as simple as pre-positioning can be quite critical in these simulations. Okay? So all I've really done here is I've gone into my robot control tab. I've pre-positioned the knuckle into perhaps a more predictable um, posture. Perhaps now I can guarantee the cables are not going to be you know, coming in close contact with the rotary table. Here I'm also coming close to a, uh, uh, a limit, which is probably not good for the longevity of the machine. So all this kind of advanced control becomes very important. Preposition, begin the recording, click on play. All right, so let me do this a little bit slower because I want to see, I want to show you something else that's quite important. Attach to start. Once again, I'm going to nudge the robot into this position over here. And if I slow down the simulation, I want, to, I want you to pay particular notice to this all-important tool work plane. So perhaps not that slow. So right now, we, we, we call this free motion. The robot, is, the, the robot solver is allowed to pick, let's call it the, the default path. So there's no restrictions on access priorities. There's no restrictions on the tool frame. If you, if you pay attention to the x-axis, you'll notice it kind of wavers as it's machining. Okay? So how else can we control and predict the, the robot motion? Well, we control the blue work plane, the tool frame. And by controlling the tool frame, we effectively control the rest of the robot. Okay? So here's an example. Let's, let's nudge this robot once again. In this instance, I'll nudge it such that the x-axis is pointing more or less away from the robot. I'm going to go to the tool control tab. And by default, we've always had this free motion. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to choose uh, to control the six axis, or, the, or the, the tool work plane, using a vector, a direction, essentially. Okay, so once again, simulate from start, click on play. And if you look carefully, the x axis is always pointing in the same direction relative to the robot. And that, is, that effectively controls joint four, five, and six, in this particular application, anyway. Okay, so I know that I'm not going to wrap up my cables. I'm not going to have them dragging around. Again, control gives you predictability. All right, so that's a three plus two toolpath and another, another one of the advanced controls. Let's, uh, let's ramp this up a little bit and let's take a look at a, a simultaneous five axis toolpath. Simultaneous means the tool orientations relative to the part is continually changing. Okay? So I'm going to send the robot home, attach it to the start point. I'm going to switch the tool control back to free. Let's see what happens. If I, if I just turn on the tool vectors, I know by default you, you just see the green tip. If I turn on the tool vectors, you can actually see where the tool orientation is going to change. Okay? I'm going to turn this off for a quick second to unclutter the screen. And let's run this through the simulation. Bearing in mind, again, the simulation right now is, is set to 
is set to 3. This is mine, isn't it, Charlie? Okay. So right now everything's good. We're kind of still in this vertical orientation. Here it starts to, to tilt. Okay, you've probably seen a little uh, red pop-up over there on the, uh, on the right-hand side. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. No real errors thus far, though. And there's the end. Okay? So I'm going to save this simulation as if I was going to post it. I'm going to come down to my simulator, and straight away I can see, well, I've got several green check marks, and then I have a bit of an issue with, a, with an axis limit being reached. This is not entirely true. Okay? You'll notice, as I get to this position over here, joint number five flags. Okay? So the, the actual limit for this joint is, is minus 130 degrees. I never actually go over that limit, but these are we can also program in soft limits. So anytime I come within five degrees of that hard limit, it, it, it could potentially cause a problem. It's, gonna, um, it, it's not the ideal optimal pose for this robot to be in. Okay? And if perhaps there's a slight uh, difference in the actual robot position as opposed to you know, the virtual robot position, it may actually hit the limit. Okay? All right, then. <clears throat> so as you can see, it's if, if as I drag that slider bar there, okay, we never actually overdo that limit, but it's definitely not ideal. So what are we going to do to, to perhaps compensate for this? Let's send the robot back home. The next step up in control we have is, is as Charlie mentioned, we call them orientation vectors. Okay? They can sound a little bit confusing initially, but they are very powerful. So what I'm going to tell Palmer is I'm going to say, similar to last time, I want the x-axis always pointing in this, let's call it an easterly direction for lack of a better word right now. Okay? So I'm going to go into my tools. I'm going to open up orientation vectors. I'm simply going to say we can have global orientation vectors or local. So I'm going to select the entire toolpath, and I'm simply going to say apply vectors according to this position. Okay, the toolpath updates. Close, simulate from start, and let's play this recording. I'll play it a little quicker this time. Maybe a little too quick. From start, play. All right, so what did I just do? Well, the x-axis pointing in that easterly direction away from the robot. Okay? So you see it doesn't waver. But you probably notice, as it gets around to this westerly direction, that's it. Okay? This is where I have a bit of an issue. So <clears throat> globally changing the, uh, the robot posture there didn't really help me. It helped me for most of the, uh, the path, except for when it comes into this tight area over here. Okay? And this is where, because of our, our restriction, the robot cannot solve this. What I am going to do, though, is I'm now going to apply some local control. So previously that was global. What do I mean by local? Well, once again, I'm going to go into my orientation vector dialog. Rather than selecting all the segments, I'm going to choose a local point. Okay? A little earlier, uh, Charlie mentioned we, we have access to the teach pendant. So here's the teach pendant over here. I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll show you this a little bit later. Um, let me turn that off. I'm going to nudge this work, this, uh, this six-axis such that it's round about taking this new pose, let's say there. So at this position, I want the robot posture to look like this. Okay? Now what's also very important when I, do, when I make these local changes is to make sure we have a good blend. Okay, so I'm going to say I want 300 millimeters blend before this point, and let's go a little more extreme and say 500 millimeters after this point. Apply the orientation vectors. So what that means there is that just before, 300 millimeters before it gets to that point, it's going to start moving to that orientation, and you'll, you'll be able to see that. Hmm. No, it's okay. No, very similar to a, to a CNC machine. So the last thing we want is an, ab an abrupt movement. I mean, it's not good for the cutting tool. It's not good for the surface finish. It's probably also not that good for the, for the, for the robot or the san sanity of the person running the robot. 
Okay. So it's not that you're, gonna con you, you're always going to have to pay this much attention to the robot posture, but it's definitely important to point out that this kind of control gives you the predictability you need when it comes to these robot parts. And that's, and that's really what we're trying to get across. All right, so a couple more things. Let me just uh, save this particular profile over here. As you can see, we're, we're now good. Uh, we mustn't uh, forget the fact that we do have a six axis here, don't we? So when we talk about an external axis, how do we interface with the external axis using, this, using the program? Well, you'll notice we have priorities next to each one of these joints. And just to go back one step, one thing I have got turned off right now, but you should probably always keep on, is the collision checking. So as Charlie mentioned, you know, if there's any potential collisions with any component part or you name it, it's going to flag red. Okay, so I did have that turned off. Next to these slider bars, you'll notice we have uh, priorities. If I right click, it'll change the priority. We can choose between low, medium, high, auto, and static. So thus far, my rotary table has continually had this static priority. What happens if I right click and change this to high? Send the robot home, attach the tool to the start, start recording. Now we have a very active external axis. Probably not what I'd want in this particular example. Okay, but the solver is trying to use the, the external axis, the rotary table, as much as possible. Okay, so in this example, again, a, a good idea of what high does, but probably not what I'd want to really employ. The other useful option for these external axes is as a positioner. So I simply want to, let's say, pre-position the rotary table to 45 degrees. Uh, set it back to static. Attach it to start and record. Okay, so in this instance we're positioning rotary table for minus 45 degrees and then it machines in that orientation. Okay, again, it's all about control. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next project then. So thus far we've been talking about milling primarily. In this next project we'll take a look at a different application, namely trimming. So how does this work then? So here we have a, a, a trimming or a profile toolpath created uh, quite easily in, in PowerMill. So once again, the four steps. First of all, select your robot cell. In this case, I'm going to select a robot cell that has the, uh, a knife defined as the end effector. Let me just uh, switch the auto transparency to off. Okay. All right, so we've built this, this knife as an end effector as opposed to previously we had the, the spindle. Okay. Step number two, the position, the alignment. We're not going to worry too much about that. Robot control for the simulation. Send the robot home. Attach it to the start position. Let me slow this down once again, and let's see what happens. So the toolpath is very similar in its creation. Okay, I'm going to speed up this simulation so I can play it back in the, uh, in the recorder. Okay, so let's... Save this. Everything looks good, but you'll notice if I start to actually simulate this, again, pay close attention to this x-axis. It doesn't really move, which means this cutting operation is, not, is definitely not going to do me any good because the direction and orientation of the knife does not change. Okay? So that brings us to the fourth and final tool control option uh, within the third tab. And that's namely follow. So I want the x-axis, the all-important tool frame, to follow the direction of the toolpath. So simply by clicking on a button, when I now say record, I'll play this back a little slower once I've saved the recording. Okay, so back into the simulator. You can now see the six-axis. If you watch the knife and the, the x-axis, or the y-axis in this case, it actually moves 
in the direction of travel. I know we haven't solved the problem completely because our knife or our blade seems to be 90 degrees out of phase. Okay? But at least it's turning now, so half the problem's been solved. Okay, all we need to do now is we need to pre-position it simply by giving it an initial starting angle. Luckily for me, it's 90 degrees. Okay. Send the robot home. Attach to start. Let's do a quick recording. Save. And in this instance, Okay, so the six-axis is essentially following the direction of the toolpath, and that's what's controlling the knife or the, the cutting operation. Okay? Quite simple, really, when you, when you think about it. Okay, so... Uh, I, we, yes, I think we've actually hit the, hit the time limit there. There's, there was another couple of things I could have shown you, James, but the bulk of the, uh, the, the, bulk of the functionality with regards to control, workflow, and hopefully also ease of use, uh, I've demonstrated. Um, let's, let's stop it there and take some, take some questions, please. How big a gap is there between what we're seeing here, which is similar to the machine, the model, or whatever, yeah. and that integration with power and spec? So if you have something that's You want if you've got a, a unique toolpath, a unique problem to be solved every single time. Mm. I want to unload and build on top. I want to I want to take parts out of things. So I know where the parts are a priori on the site. Yep. But I, if, if it's going to take me two hours to program the robot, I might as well do it by hand. Mm -hmm. Is how difficult is it, given a fairly constrained set of circumstances, to automate the toolpath generate the the, the robot? Is it what, what do you call it? The, so the, uh, this robot robot the robot programming, so we can automate the toolpath generation very easily with macros. The robot programming uh, is not drivable by macros at the moment. Um, one of the things that, I'm not in, I, without seeing your application, it's difficult to comment, but one of the things that we're looking at, um, without giving any dates, but in the sort of, yeah, in, but in the quite near future, one of the things we're, we're looking at and investigating is uh, adding probing and scanning into the, uh, the robot interface, basically. So once you had that, you would be able to possibly probe or scan to feed that into the process, that you, your manufacturing process. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, it would need, I'd need to see the application really to comment properly on it, but... Um, yeah, at, at present you can't drive the robot simulation with macros because there is that human element of analyzing whether the result is acceptable or once not. You've got a, presumably once you've got a recipe a little bit like the CNC, you're going to have pretty high confidence, right, that as long as you haven't changed parameters dramatically, uh, it's going to go pretty quickly. Yeah, you, yeah, I would think so. Though there are, I mean, there are, again, depending on what it is that you change, but there is an element here of um, there's, there's obviously a, a fairly decent number of, amount of numbers that go into an algorithm that solves each position. So changing one of those numbers can have a relatively significant impact on the overall output of the robot, which is one of the reasons why we feel that this type of visual environment um, and visual representation of the simulation is so important um, because you simply don't know what the robot's going to do without it. You know, I like to explain it. People say, you know, is my application suited to this? And I always, like, I always like to draw, what I've just done now is I've drawn the points on the toolpath. So, and you've got to ask yourself, well, if I'm, if I'm doing the traditional pick and place or teach and learn, which is literally teach pennant, you know, with these universal robots, you can actually hold them and go click, click, click. But generally speaking, you're kind of, you're driving the robot to position, you're saying save, next one, save, next one, save. So if, if you have... 50, perhaps even 100, 200 positions. It's not too bad to follow that process. But if you take a look at all the toolpath points, and this is a very simple cutting operation. We've got, uh, I think it tells me somewhere here, where is the points? 836 points. This is when the realm of, of teach and learn is, is just, just, just simply doesn't make sense. And this is very simple. If you think of like the, the 3D sculpting um, 
scenarios that we, we, you saw a little bit earlier. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of points. That's really when the application comes into its own. If there is less points than 100, well, perhaps, like you say, you know, there's probably merit to, to not spending all this time in the software package but just using the teach and learn program. Primarily, if, it's, if, if those 200 points are going to be used for the next three hours, easy, yes. If as soon as you input customization into it, like mass producing custom parts, yeah. well, then it's the, the question, the answer becomes difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, uh, the button, the, the, the prime, <clears throat> the automatic easy button, I like to call it, the, the most common error on a, on a, on a robot is, uh, is going to be, well, apart from collisions and something, is going to be something called uh, the wrist singularity. Generally speaking, these, these robots, if they're going to have a problem, it's going to be the wrist singularity issue. So for the wrist singularity, we do have an automatic button automatically wrist singularity avoidance. So for that one we do, for all the other options, it's going to be more of a manual <coughs> control type effect here. So, so again, there are, um, just in terms of future developments and things that we can do to improve the software, um, we are investigating solving multiple solutions for other things like access limits. So if there is a detection of an access limit being reached, we can run through other, when we talk about these multiple configurations, we could run through another configuration to see, do we hit the same access limits if we go for one of the other eight possible configurations. So those types of things are areas that are under investigation at the moment. Mm. It's, kind of, it's one of those where, you know, the more automated you make the solution, the less predictable, because how does it avoid it? Does it, kind of, does, it, does it swing something? Does it move apart? Whereas Right now, what we can do now, like it would be nice to have the, the, the single click easy button, but what we have now is we've given you the control to predict the motion. So, but, but like Charlie said, it would be nice for certain, for certain applications just to give me, the, give me the easiest and quickest. Yes, I didn't actually, that was next, and I kind of, we kind of ran out of time. If you want to, I don't know when we have to vacate the room, but I'm more than happy to kind of show you the connection moves. Jeff's, Jeff actually runs a robot with, with Powerball, but not the robot application. Um, so here we have a single toolpath. He's asking, when we have multiple toolpaths, perhaps, I mean, think about the scenario where you've got a, an automobile. You kind of want a machine, you know, you clay milling on the back of the automobile, and then you want another toolpath on the front of the automobile. How do you, how do you, how do you ensure that when it gets from this toolpath to that one, that it does so safely. And we use something called teach and learn waypoints. So we more or less, you use a teach pendant, you drag the robot along and you'll say, teach one point, teach the second point, teach the third point. And then you can position these transition points in between your toolpaths. So be be before you write an, an NC program, you're going to say, okay, this NC program is going to contain toolpath number one, then it's going to go to transition point number one, when I say transition point, it could be transition path consisting of five points. Then it's going to do toolpath number two. So you're effectively kind of, you're teaching and learning the transition points between toolpaths. And you can specify, for each of those points, you can specify an orientation. And one of the things that I spoke about in the introduction about tracing that tooltip is for that exact scenario. So you can see the path that it's taking between the point A and point B, what path is it taking and do I need to add another transition point or am I happy with the route that it's taking between those two points? Those transition points are collision checked. And then, and then the same thing happens if you're going back to the tool chain. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You, would, you would save a, a transition point and you would call it tool change. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that's it. Thank you.